what we're going to talk about today is when to screen a child for hyperlipidemia, the common patterns of hyperlipidemia in children, and learn what we talk about in our clinic, the diet modifications, behavior modifications, and medications that we use in the clinic. We know that atherosclerosis begins in childhood. There's lots of studies, and one of my favorite slides that I've seen in other lectures is a picture of a very obese man saying, there's no such thing as a sudden heart attack. Everything starts in childhood, and there's lots of data out there um, from autopsies showing that fibrous plaques, fatty streaks all start in childhood. Some of the big studies are, are the pathobiological determinants of atherosclerosis or the PDAY study, looking at people 15 to 34 that died either of homicide, accidents, um, or of, of other causes. And they showed that these young children already had fatty streaks and fibrous plaques, and that the amount of those fatty streaks and fibrous plaques correlated with the cholesterol found in their serum. The Bogalusa heart study down, done down in Louisiana also showed the same thing, that there were fatty streaks and plaques in 50% of children and 85% of young adults, and that these lesions correlated with risk factors like total cholesterol, LDL, triglycerides, blood pressure, and body mass index. And the more risk factors you had, the more fatty streaks or plaques that you had. Uh, we know also that many things track from youth to adulthood, so there's been many studies showing that the lipid values that you see in children track into adulthood. So the Muscatine study showed that 75% of the children that had high cholesterol as a child had as, as an adult, and Bogalusa showed also 70%. We know that many other things track from youth to adulthood, so if children are obese, they tend to become obese adults. If children um, exercise, they tend to exercise as adults. If they start smoking as a kid, they continue smoking as adults. So lots of things begin in childhood and track to adulthood, and that's why we're really pushing our kids to have a healthier lifestyle in terms of what they eat and how much activity they have. Cholesterol concentrations when you're born are very low. Typically, uh, when you're first born, if you take a sample, the total cholesterol is actually very low at 70, LDL being only 30, and HDL at 35. Over the next two years, it rapidly increases, and it peaks around 9 to 11 years of age at about 171 milligrams per deciliter. As you start to hit puberty, the cholesterol levels actually start to go down a little bit. You have a honeymoon phase, I like to tell my patients, so if they come in with a high LDL at age 10, I know it's going to go down a little bit, but then it's going to go back up after they're done with puberty. HDL levels do fall, though they fall permanently uh, in puberty. And there's also ethnic differences. So African Americans tend to have a higher HDL and lower triglycerides than whites and Hispanics. These are some of the cut points for cholesterol. When we get a fasting lipid panel, we typically are just checking the total cholesterol, the LDL, the HDL, and the triglycerides. There's some other values on here, but I do recommend checking a full fasting lipid profile. So the total cholesterol cutoff is about 170 milligrams per deciliter. LDL goal is less than 110, and I have on my next slide one to refer to us. Uh, the triglycerides varies with age, but typically we like it less than 130 or 150, and HDL we like above uh, 45. A new and emerging number is the total um, non-HDL cholesterol, which is the total cholesterol minus the HDL. This has been shown in one pediatric study and many adult studies to really show the atherosclerotic burden. So it, really is a burden of what is your LDL, but also the other atherogenic particles like your VLDL, your IDL, and a particle called LP little a. ApoB and ApoA1, we're not checking as much, but those are things that are up and coming. So when to refer to us? I like to see children when their total cholesterol is greater than 200. I like to see them if their LDL is greater than 130, if they have a low HDL or a high triglyceride, so the HDL Ideally, it should be 40 to 45, and triglycerides, if they're greater than 150, uh, that would be appropriate to refer. So who are we screening? Um, here's a case here. There's a 14-year-old boy whose father uh, passed away at age 60 and had, had a, a heart attack and a hyperlipidemia prior to that. So that kind of kid you're going to know about. It's going to be easy to um, decide to screen him. There's been many revisions in the guidelines. Uh, the first guidelines were put out by the National Cholesterol Education Program in 1992. The American Academy of Pediatrics then revised them and added some um, more recommendations in 1998 and then again in 2008, and we're still waiting for the National Cholesterol Education Program to revise their guidelines again. I do know that they have written them, and there's some controversy about them that I'll talk about as we go along, and hopefully they'll really be released at the end of the summer. 
So the AAP in 1998 recommended uh, measuring a fasting uh, total cholesterol. In 2008, they revised that to asking for a full lipid profile. They recommended screening people who have a family history of high cholesterol or early atherosclerosis. That hasn't changed. If the family history is unknown, it was optional before, recommending to, tr to screen now if the family history is unknown. Uh, before it was optional, if there are personal risk factors, now they're recommending if there are personal risk factors, so those would be obesity, hypertension. Initially, they also recommended screening every five years. Now they've brought that to every three to five years, and you can screen as early as age two. Also now acknowledging that there are age-specific sex uh, specific and ethnic differences amongst cholesterol values, so trying to look at the norms for each patient. Uh, and again, measuring all the triglycerides and the HDL components. So if we look at the initial recommendations from 1998, recommending that you screen patients that have a family history of early cardiovascular disease, so if there's someone that had an event less than age 55, to get a total cholesterol, that would miss a lot of kids. Only 35 to 46 percent of kids were really being screened, and lots of kids were still being missed if we just used those 1998 guidelines. So universal screening, I think it's coming, and this is the reason probably why the new National Cholesterol Education Program guidelines are in a stalemate. Uh, the NIH group has made them, and I believe that they are again going to ask that we screen everyone. But this is going to be huge because we're going to be getting fasting lipid profiles, and who's going to deal with it? What cutoffs are we going to use? Who's going to be referred to us? Who are you going to treat in your office? What kind of resources do you have? Are you going to do the counseling? Am I going to do the counseling? And so they're not uh, going to be releasing them until they have some systems in place helping you and helping me decide who's going to come into the subspecialist and who's going to be treated and how you're going to treat them. Obviously, it's an advantage because you're going to treat more children, you're going to find them earlier, and you're probably going to diagnose other family members. But this is going to be a huge uh, burden to your practice, to my practice, and also psychological consequences. Talking about cholesterol, talking about eating habits um, has many, many difficulties. You have young women who have eating disorders. You're going to, it's a fine line between recommending what they need to eat and how much they need to exercise and maintaining a healthy balance in their emotional well being. Okay, so here's another child who had his cholesterol checked. His total was very high at 300 milligrams per deciliter, LDL 226 milligrams per deciliter, remembering that the normal is less than 110. His HDL was fine at 65, and triglycerides were nice and low at 40. So he obviously has a very high LDL cholesterol. When it's really greater than 180, we start to think about a disease called familial hyperlipidemia. And this has been the model for really why we start to treat kids. We know with familial hyperlipidemia they have an autosomal dominant disorder that starts to be manifest early on. They have high cholesterol, high lipid levels, high LDL, and they have those fatty streaks, and they start to have early cardiovascular events. We know that if we don't treat them, that most of them will start to have events even as early as, as age 30 and 40. Uh, you can see from the slide that it's very common. It's 1 in 300 to 1 in 500 in North America, and even more common in Quebec and South Africa and Afrikaners. In Europe, they're actually genotyping everybody. There's about 800 different genetic mutations. We're not there yet. We don't genotype everyone. Uh, we have been doing it uh, with a study protocol, but it's not common practice. There is something called a MedPed registry that actually started in Utah and has moved to uh, Europe, showing that they, these patients with familial hyperlipidemia have heart events early. So if you look at the two, uh, or the four lines, the blue and the green here are non-FH people and the probability of clinical coronary artery disease is on this axis here, and you really don't have a lot of heart disease until you're older. But in people with FH, you can see they start to have cardiac events, whether it be a myocardial infarction, uh, stroke, or something else, uh, very early on, as early as age 40. So looking at the patients with familial hyperlipidemia, knowing that they have plaque being put down early, that's what start, started the whole business of treating and who to treat and when to treat. Um, intimate media thickness has been a surrogate marker for uh, cardiovascular disease, so we can't always wait um, until adulthood. So we are really looking at how thick is the intimate media and the carotid as a marker for how likely are you going to, or how likely you are to have a heart event. Um, and so the thicker you are, and the cutoff is about 0.8, the thicker you are, the more likely you are to have a heart event. So this uh, red line is those patients with FH. You can see that they start to have too thick uh, intimate media thickness around age 40, whereas the normal curve, it doesn't occur until um, 80. 
If you start to treat early, here at 30, you can move that line down. And the concept has been to treat earlier and earlier, when, when can we safely start treatment to really prevent um, the progression and the development of cardiovascular disease. So a lot of the studies and a lot of the trials have been shown that if you start treating as early as age 10, the AAP recently recommended we can push that a little bit even to age 8, that you can really bring that risk of having a cardiovascular um, mishap much, much more like the normal population. Okay. So can you in inhibit uh, the progression of atherosclerosis by lowering um, LDL cholesterol? And the answer is yes. So how do we do that? We don't first start with medications, obviously. We first start with our counseling, and that includes diet and exercise, always, always, always. In healthy children less or greater than age two, the AHA, the AAP, and the National Cholesterol Education Programs have all recommended having a diet low in saturated fat, low in uh, total fat, and using the age-appropriate number of calories to support growth and development. So obviously caloric intake is gonna vary from age to age and making it uh, individual for each patient. Generally, we recommend a step one diet, which is a saturated fat less than 10%, the total fat is less than 30%, and the dietary cholesterol is less than 300. I tell my patients it's gonna take them a lot longer to uh, shop because they start to need to read food labels. I want them to pay attention to the fat content. They should avoid everything with trans fat in it if possible, looking at the total fat, but really looking at the saturated fat content. And if there's more, then I give them a guideline of about 2.5 grams of saturated fat per serving, then they should not buy whatever that food is. And also pay attention to how many serving sizes. Lots of people go to CVS or 7-Eleven and buy a bag of chips, and we all know that there's more than one serving size, so they need to really be able to read those food labels. So the specific AHA strategies for kids greater than two have recommended lots of exercise, and lots of kids are not getting this. So we recommend moderate exercise every single day for 60 minutes. Fruits and vegetables, limiting juice intake. Sadly, most of our kids drink lots of juice, and that's their biggest source of fruit, um, but it's all sweetened and, and it's not good. Uh, using um, soft margarines uh, that are low in saturated fat and trans fat instead of butter or animal fats, using whole grains instead of um, refined white breads, uh, again, reducing the sugar-sweetened beverages and eating or drinking non-fat or low-fat milk. Also increasing fish consumption, we really try to encourage people to eat fish twice a week, using lean cuts of meat, um, and also taking the skin off poultry when you're cooking, reducing salt intake, Balancing the meals, portion size, it's really important. A lot of parents serve the kids what they would eat and letting them know that you know the kids don't need to eat the same amount of food that the parents are eating. So portion sizes and caloric contents of each thing. A lot of kids are eating empty calories um, and there's a lot of snacking going on and those just add calories to the total diet and they don't really need to be there. And also encourage eating at home. Lots of families go out to eat very often. They have this perce perception that life is too busy to cook at home. And we like to give them specific examples or even menus where it's easy to really cook a home-cooked meal that's healthier, it's tasty, and it, it can be done fairly quickly. One other thing I want to comment on is the school lunches. I didn't put it in here. The school lunches are getting better, but uh, I know Montgomery County, for example, has on their website the nutritional content of all their meals. I have it at the end of the talk if we have time. And I try to help them figure out what to eat and what not to eat, because lots of these kids get free breakfast, free lunch, and they're really dependent on the, on the school for their food. And for example, really avoiding the chips ole or the mac and cheese, they have tons of fat, and they're really unhealthy. And also, a lot of these families that do get the free and reduced lunch, if you ask them to bring their lunch a couple days a week, they're really open to doing that. They, they can do it, it's just easier not to do it. Um, and the final new recommendation from the AAP was recommending a kid for kids as young as 12 months that they can have low-fat milk. This is a new recommendation. So if the kids are overweight or obese, even at a year, low-fat milk would be appropriate. Okay, so, going, so just a little bit more about the family education. We really spend a lot of time with these patients. They have hour-long appointments with myself, and they also have the opportunity to meet with the nutritionist. They have one-on-one -on -one appointments with the nutritionist, but we also offer classes where they can sort of hear other people's challenges and solutions and really hopefully it will help them be more successful at home. So we talk about the fats and the fibers. This is probably hard to see, but I wanted to include it so you have it. And again, it's all about reading food labels for the patients, because a lot of patients are not educated and they, and they don't really know. So we talk to them about limiting the saturated fats, because we know that leads directly to having a high LDL. 
The monounsaturated fats um, are the vegetable oils, avocado and canola, and we do recommend that they continue to use those. The polyunsaturated fats are the omega-6s and omega-3s. Those are also good fats, and we want to keep them in the diet. Really, sometimes I've seen patients that come in young, five, with having high cholesterol, and I talk to them about the fats, and if, if they've heard it a little bit, sometimes they've cut out all fat, and we really need to make sure that they're keeping these fats in their diet because they're good for them. Um, specifically, the omega-3s, we talk about a little bit with the high triglyceride patients. Those are the EPAs and the DHAs. Those are in the fish oil pills, and those are quite good and have been shown to reduce triglycerides. And finally, trans fats in commercially prepared foods, baked goods, cookies are just bad in general. Dairy, we recommend skim milk or 1% milk. Low-fat cheeses, a lot of patients eat regular cheese, and it's very easy fix just to buy the low-fat instead of the regular. We recommend light spreadable margarine and buying low-fat ice cream uh, if they really need a dessert choice. If you increase the fiber, you're also going to reduce the cholesterol, and so we give them specific examples about how they can increase their fiber intake. It can be easy as uh, giving vegetables at every uh, dinner, eating fruits as snacks, um, using whole grain breads with more than three grams of fiber. Certain cereals have more fiber than others, so making good choices when you're having breakfast at home. Cheerios, frosted mini wheats, and kicks are some examples. Eating low-fat popcorn and making sure you drink lots of water. Also, activity. We talked a little bit about the school, about how they're trying to be better with, um, with the school lunches and school breakfast, but what we really are seeing are a lot of kids are not doing a lot of physical activity. I'm sure when you talk to them, you hear the same thing, that most of them have PE class maybe once or twice a week. If you're lucky, recess is limited. You really don't need to take a lot of PE in high school, and they're not doing much after school. So we really would like them to do 60 minutes a day. I tell them I know it's daunting. It doesn't need to be 60 minutes at a time. It can be 30 and 30. However, they can get it into their regimen. I tell them it's my homework to them. They need to exercise. They have plenty of time to watch TV. They, can always, they always seem to have lots of time to do that. They're, they really should only be in front of the screen, whether it's TV, computer, or DS, or whatever, for less than two hours. So I tell them, you know, you first need to go outside and play, get that activity in before you even sit down to watch TV. Um, there is something online that you can find. It's called the National Capital Region Survey of Childhood Obesity. It's very interesting, showing us how we're doing in terms of our nutrition at school and our physical activity. And none of the elementary schools met the requirements for 150 minutes per week. None. And when you go look at the recesses, the average recess time was only 15 minutes. Montgomery County was a little better. Their recess was 30 minutes, but having a child in the school, I know that a lot of that time is spent leaving the lunchroom and coming back, and so I'm sure they're not outside for, for all that long. Also, the number of semesters to uh, graduate from high school is also very low. They, they take their minimum amount of PE, and then they're out of there. So I really try not to depend on PE for activity. I try to encourage them. A lot of patients have Again, there's always a barrier that they perceive, so I try to figure out what that is and how they can work it into their house. Um, you know, what kind of neighborhood do they live in? Do they have exercise equipment in the house? What do the kids like to do? Uh, can I, you know, just get a jump rope? Can you bike? Can you scooter? Um, you know, sometimes they, there's no playground or they don't perceive the outside as being um, safe. Go up and down the stairs, buy an exercise video, get one from the library. I try to find many solutions so that we can hit on something that they can be successful with. And then worse comes to worse, it seems like everyone has a Wii, and so I, okay, you can buy Wii Fit, and please, you know, do the ones that require you actually move. Okay, so again, this is just the highlights between the 1998 AAP and the 2008. So uh, in 1998, they recommended nutritional therapy at two, and now we're talking about even at one, we can do the low fat and the skim milks. And, um, and then stepping up the guidelines a little bit, really doing what's a step two diet, getting the saturated fat down to 7% the trans fat out and limiting dietary cholesterol and um, really encouraging activity as a way to manage the weight. So we talk about it every time, the diet and exercise, diet and exercise, but sometimes it doesn't work and sometimes they need a little bit more. And so the next thing that we may do in our clinics is recommend um, supplements and these would be fibers or plant sterols. We talked a little bit about the fiber. It reduces the LDL cholesterol by binding with the cholesterol and the bile acids and removing it from the circulation. A good rule of thumb is a child's H plus 5 up to 20 grams a day as a goal to help bring it down, and it's found in fruits and vegetables and whole grains. I like to use plant sterols. It has been shown to reduce cholesterol by 5 to 10%. There's no studies in children, but there have been some in adults, 
and it's found in available foods like margarine, orange juice, yogurt drinks, and dietary supplements. There used to be a great yogurt drink that they took off the market, um, but there's ne it's now in the, these other um, food sources. With the margarines, you have to have a fair amount of margarine. I think it's about three teaspoons a day. A lot of people don't have that much margarine, so you can have the margarine and the orange juice or a margarine and a cereal bar, and it really does work. I do recommend that they take a multivitamin daily if they're going to do it because they might decrease the absorption of the fat-soluble vitamins. Um, this is a list of some of the plant sterols I like just to keep handy as I'm asking the patients to go get it. Unfortunately, a lot of them are Kroger products, which are not available here, but some of the other ones, the Minute Maid, uh, the patients can find. And when I'm really stuck, there's a website uh, with Benacol. They have chews. They're made by the same people as Viactive. Uh, and so you can have the chews as a source of, pl of the plant sterols. Okay, so that second patient that had the high LDL 226 had the diet and activity uh, counseling and unfortunately came back and the LDL was still high at 253 and so he needed medical therapy. So when do we start medical therapy? We really like them to be at least uh, 10 years of age but sometimes we do push the envelope and can start as early as age 8. Girls ideally should have started their periods and should have regular periods and we always talk to the girls in the family about the teratogenic effect. So if they're going to get pregnant, um, which hopefully they're not gonna do at that young age, but they need to come off and they need to remember that because often we will start it and then they continue uh, as they go off to college and they need to know that if they do get pregnant, they need to come off their medications. So we start them when, if their LDL is greater than 190 and they have no risk factors for other diseases, or if their LDL is greater than 160 and there's a family history of early premature cardiovascular disease, or they have other risk factors, so they're overweight, they have hypertension, or they have other diseases that may go along with increased risk for cardiovascular disease. And those other diseases are familial hyperlipidemia, but diabetes, chronic kidney disease, maybe they've had a heart transplant, Kawasaki with giant coronary artery aneurysms, inflammatory diseases, kids that have had childhood cancer and have survived, and kids with congenital heart disease. Um, so if it, kid is eight and has a very high LDL cholesterol, so that would be greater than 500, it would be appropriate to start medical therapy. Obviously, I'd be seeing them, and those are usually the kids with homozygous familial hyperlipidemia, so they have two, um, two mutations, and they have no LDL receptors, and so they have a high circulating uh, LDL. In addition to medical therapy, they typically need, well, they need the statin, they need Zetia, and they usually get um, plasmapheresis to really clear their body from uh, the LDL. But in the other children, if they've not had any good response, they've not gotten down to goal, then we start medical therapy after six to 12 months. In 1998, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommended bile acid sequesterants as the first line. In 2008, uh, that was changed to statins. They also changed the, the bottom uh, age to eight versus 10. This had a lot of controversy when it came out in 2008. Um, and that's because we have some studies. The studies are all like, you know, watching kids for three or four years. We certainly don't know what it's like to be on a statin for 70 years. We don't have any long-term data. And we don't know 100% that we're preventing disease. But we do know from the study that we are pro limiting the progression of fatty streaks and fatty plaques. And so we have to imply that we're really having an impact on future events in kids. So the lipid-lowering agents that we use are statins fibric acid derivatives, bile acid sequestrants, and cholesterol absorption inhibitors. So I'll talk um, about them. Um, it's important to note that not all of them are FDA approved for children. So lovastatin, simvastatin, pravastatin, and torvastatin are the statins that are FDA approved. Uh, Colosavalum is a uh, bile acid sequestrant that is also FDA approved. I've been involved in several of these studies and I can tell you that a lot of them are not FDA approved because the drug companies are not interested. It doesn't make them a lot of money to go that next step to get the FDA approval. So we do use Zetia, for example, off-label. So the statins, either, these are the ones that are really are recommended that are most commonly used. In children with familial hyperlipidemia, it's been shown that there's a 20 to 40% reduction in serum LDL. It inhibits the HMG-CoA reductase. It limits and reduces cholesterol synthesis. You get an upregulation of the receptor, so more LDL is drawn into the liver and less is circulating. There's been several studies. Um, this is one on pravastatin called the lipid study. It looked at that intima media thickness that we talked about before in children with FH using uh, pravastatin. So it looked at the IMT at baseline at 52 weeks and 104 weeks. And what they showed was that there was a um, a reduction in LDL of 24%, and it also 
uh, they saw a reduction in the IMT thickness. Here's a reduction in the IMT thickness that was very significant over placebo. Also, the drug was well tolerated. There was no adverse events. No one really had a bump in their uh, liver enzymes, ALT, AST, or CPK. One child did, and it was someone in the placebo group. There were no changes in endocrine function. That's important because we know cholesterol is very important in the making of uh, the hormones, and everyone continued on puberty, and their hormone synthesis was normal uh, with no effect on growth or development. So this study showed that pravastatin caused a re um, regression of the IMT in children, and it seemed safe and effective in lowering uh, LDL cholesterol. Similar study in Zocor, although they use what's called flow-mediated dilation, another uh, endpoint in how, you're, how your body is reacting to um, inflammation. And what they showed was that it was efficacious. It reduced uh, total cholesterol, LDL. It actually raised HDL as well a little bit. And there was no adverse effects. Uh, again, on liver function, no one had myopathies. There were no changes in hormones, no effect on growth and development. This actually lowered LDL by 41% and was well tolerated. So there's been many studies on all the different drugs, not just these two on the statins that are RFDA approved, showing that they are well tolerated because don't get myopathies. They don't get liver enzyme abnormalities um, any more than adults do. And in fact, I've never had a problem with any of my kids having a liver enzyme abnormality. And they continue to grow and develop normally. Some of the side effects that we do counsel the patients on is they can have GI upset, muscle cramps or myopathy, or elevated liver amenases. And so they need to be followed. We typically start them on the lowest dose, uh, and we target their LDL. We'd like to get them uh, less than 130 or less than 110 if they have other high-risk diseases. Um, so we'll start them on the medication, the low dose, and then after four weeks, we repeat their blood work, getting a fasting liver profile, along with the LFTs and the CKs, making sure that there's no adverse effects. If, it, if we've achieved what we want in lipid lowering, we continue the dose at the same, and then recheck in four to eight weeks and every six months, but also counseling them that if they start to have myopathy or uh, abdominal pain that they need to let me know, stop the medications, and we'll check blood work. If we've not at our target, then we double the dose and recheck things uh, again four weeks later. If goals are not met, we can continue doubling the dose, but really if you double it once, you're gonna get the most effect of that drug, and so you may need to change the statin or you can add a second drug. Okay. Um, also, if they have renal insufficiency, the dose should be a little bit lower, and also we ask that you know, they let us know if they're using other, other, any other medications, especially the ones that work uh, with the same uh, mechanism. The other set of drugs that we use are bile acid sequestrants. These were the ones that used to be used, uh, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s. They bind intestinal bile acids and cause epercalation of the LDL receptor and then lower it that way. They're not as effective and they have not been in general that well tolerated. In the, in the past, they've been the powdery drinks that you put in your water or whatever, but they cause a lot of constipation and bloating. Well color colosavalum um, is the one that I use on occasion. It's unfortunately, it's six pills. Uh, it doesn't cause the bloating that uh, the other drugs cause, but it is six pills, and I tell the patients they're not small. They're about the size of a calcium supplement. So if they're not comfortable going to statin because they think it's more systemic, the bile acid sequestrants are not systemic. They act purely on the GI tract. Um, I would go with Wellcall if I have to, um, but it's not ideal because it is a six pills to get the, the full effect. But this is one that I would feel comfortable starting in someone that's only eight years of age. Um, cholesterol absorption inhibitors are another good option. These are not FDA approved though for kids, but we are using them off-label. Um, they pre prevent intestinal absorption of cholesterol in plant sterols. The dose is 10 milligrams. We actually looked at our population at the hospital here, and we saw that there was a 28% decrease in the total cholesterol and an 18% decrease in LDL cholesterol, and that there were no effects on triglycerides HDL, and the patients also did not have bad side effects in terms of muscle enzymes. Um, or um, liver enzymes. So follow up with that one case, a kid with familial hyperlipidemia whose LDL was 253 after, uh, before statins, after statins it was 190. He was on lovastatin 10. We doubled his dose and his LDL went down to 140. A third case, I'm gonna go quickly because we only have 10 minutes. This is uh, probably something more common. Uh, and your population is a young girl who's probably obese triglycerides of 615. When the triglycerides are over 400, you cannot calculate LDL. 
So hypertriglyceridemia really is back to the basics. It's diet and exercise, diet and exercise, diet and exercise. We also counsel the patients that when you have a high uh, triglycerides, you're at risk for, hepat or, uh, for fatty liver disease, and you're also at risk for pancreatitis. And so if they have persistent abdominal pain, we need to assess their amylase and their lipase. Uh, I am following one child jointly with uh, GI who does have fatty liver disease, who's very obese and is on a strict diet of um, almost low and no carbs until she hopefully gets better. Um, so again, we want to have the complex carbohydrates and eliminate the simple carbohydrates. This is by behavior modification and the family. It's really the, the whole family needs to change their life. It can't just be the child. It's not fair to have snacks or to ask the other, let the other kids um, to eat uh, this, uh, the fatty foods. It really needs to be the whole family being invested in behavior modification and lifestyle modification. So again, we talk about all the fats. We talk about increasing f the fiber. We really try to limit the drinks in particular and the snacks. So the drinks should have less than 10 calories per serving, really reinforcing the exercise, eating fruits and vegetables, and working closely with our nutritionists. In fact, sometimes I'll have them come back and see the nutritionist more often than they may see me because that's the piece they really need. They really need someone to reinforce to them uh, what they're eating does make a difference. You know, we give them specific handouts, so instead of soda, I do recommend diet soda if they're going to drink soda. Try to eliminate Gatorades, Powerades, and vitamin water with lots of sugar in it, and go to the G2 or the Zeros. The Kool-Aids, I like to eliminate for Crystal Light and the Sun and Delight, um, sugar-free Tang. Anything with Splenda is better than the sweetened beverages. Um, you have this list for your handout, really just to try and switch out the simple carbs for the complex carbs. We really try to get them to eat more fruits and vegetables, vegetables more whole grains, um, and try to eliminate just regular sugar, corn syrup, all the stuff that you see really as the first 10 ingredients on all the snack foods. So that young child went home, had a low-fat diet, uh, reduced the amount of juice she was drinking, drank more water, started playing sports, uh, organized and not organized, and really um, had some success. She brought her triglycerides down from 615 to 237. So that's a big improvement. It's still not normal. It's not the 150 or below that we would like, but it's much closer to the normal range. And sort of out of the alarm zone for pancreatitis. Pancreatitis usually occurs close to 1,000. Remember, this is a fasting sample, that's 615, so 237 is much better. So if it's still, if the triglycerides are still high, then I would recommend the fish oil pills. Um, they should try to eat fish several times a week if possible, other times if they can't or if it's just not enough. And I do recommend that they take fish oil pills, looking specifically for the EPA or the DHA part of it, trying to make sure that those are maximized. Um, there's really only one that's known and has been shown to really work, and that's Loava, but that is prescription. I think it's worth just trying any over-the-counter fish oil pill, and you do see some decrease. And kids that have extremely elevated uh, triglycerides, we do also recommend fibrates, but this needs to be done very carefully and closely. So this young girl, after starting fish oil pills, was able to get her triglycerides down to 194, and this is a work in progress. Um, so fibric acid derivatives can lower the triglycerides. Again, we only use them in severe uh, situations and usually only in older adolescents. There's only very limited data for this. The fourth case, and this is probably most of what we see every day, this kid got referred in because uh, family history. His total cholesterol initially was 223. His LDL was 156. HDL 68. Triglycerides 44. So the LDL was moderately elevated, but it was not in a range that we would recommend specific medical therapy. So we did lots of diet and counseling, and unfortunately he comes back and his LDL is now 164. So really when he's honest, he says he eats what's ever in the house. And what I like to ask patients to do, especially the older ones, they need to keep a, a, a journal, a diary, let me know what they're eating. If they do that, then they can really monitor how much is going in, and I tell them to be specific. I want to know if they have three potato chips or if they have, you know, a cup, because we can really go down to the nitty gritty and really alter what they eat. There are some websites, I like to use fitday.com on the internet, or some iPhone apps that really help them monitor what they're eating so they can see the calories in, to make sure that calories in and calories out is, is, is basically equal. So just going, you know, going through with them, trying to switch from 2% to 1%, or a lot of kids are still having whole milk, just getting that out of the diet. Um, and then this particular mom reduced the cheese and the ice cream, and, and so they're getting better. Uh, and his last LDL was 126. Um, 
So of all the kids that we see, only a small percent, less than 1% actually do need medical therapy. Most of them really just need intensive counseling, looking at their diet, looking at their exercise patterns, and helping them find ways to be successful in, in getting better. Um, so just to, let, just to come back to the beginning, when we're born, our arteries are clean. We start to have high LDL cholesterol as we begin to snack and eat bad foods. We start to develop the fatty streaks, the fibrous plaques, which then can break off, causing infarcts, strokes, gangrene, and aneurysms. So the, the picture really starts in childhood. So we need to, to talk to these kids, talk to the families, make them make changes. Right now, the screening is targeted, but may become universal. And so thinking about how we're going to handle that later. And the treatment strategies are always start with diet and behavior modifications. Then we go to nutritional supplements, and then finally medications. And the goal is to prevent cardiovascular disease. Thank you. So we have a couple minutes for questions. This is very practical pediatrics. You all see these kids in your office. So um, um, down here, and Sarah, can you repeat the question? Yeah. The question is how many eggs can the kids have? Is that the, oh, the yolks? Um, I generally, most of the kids I'm seeing have high cholesterol, so I tell them about three egg yolks a week. Um, but I suspect, you know, if they have normal cholesterol, you could probably have a little bit more. Dr. Tender? I have two questions. One is about the value of using the lipoprotein that lay as a screening tool for, um, and also the, the disadvantages of, of just doing a non-fasting lipid. My understanding is it only really affects triglycerides. I just want to make sure that's correct information. Right. So the question first is about the LP little a in, in screening. And I actually do use that on occasion. It is a measure of the atherogenic, atherogenic particles that are out there. And I think it also helps if you don't know the family history. LP little a tends to be very genetic and is not affected by much in terms of diet and medications. And so I use that as a marker if I have a borderline um, LDL cholesterol. If I have a high L LP little a, I might treat more aggressively. Um, and the second question was about the non-fasting. Um, so obviously, a lot of patients come into the office not fasting, and sometimes you have problems with follow-up. And so I do, if it is a time to catch them, I would recommend just going ahead and getting a non-fasting sample, knowing that really it will mostly affect the triglycerides. Um, and if it comes back abnormal, then you have to decide what to do with that. But if it's going to be an encounter where you don't think you might get them again, I think getting a non-fasting sample is fine. Yep. Dr. Fishman, talking to my tie. <laughs> Um, can you go over the recommendations for referral to the cardiologist? Because if it's truly over 200, you're, I just don't see that happening, either with the volume of kids who are going to go to the cardiologist. Um, it's going to be tremendous. Right, right. And whether you really want to see them. <laughs> I would love to see your patients. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So I really, the total number is there, but I really like to see why it's high, and I tell the patients that as well, because if the HDL is high, then obviously I don't want to see them. So if that's the reason why it's, the total is high, the, the total, as you know, is the LDL plus the HDL plus the triglycerides divided by five. So if any of those numbers are high, it's going to push it up. So if it's up because the HDL is high, then obviously they don't need to see me. The ones that really I feel like first we need to target are the ones that have the high LDLs, the LDLs greater than 130. I definitely want to see those. But I also think it's important if the triglycerides are high, I have 150, but it's certainly if they're above 300, they need to come in because they are probably the kids that are going to have metabolic syndrome, that probably have acanthosis and agricans that have insulin resistance and are going to have blood pressure issues and just going to be unhealthy in general. Um, so I would say first and foremost, the LDL greater than uh, 130, triglycerides 150, but if they're greater than 300, that's absolutely they need to come in. The HDL, if it's low, it's sort of hard. There's not much we can do other than recommending um, diet and exercise modifications. There's no drug right now for kids to help raise uh, HDL. There was a drug that they tried to put on the market a couple years ago, and it was found to have lots of problems, so it was quickly pulled off. Um, so I would rather you do, do the whole lipid profile and look specifically at the LDL and the triglycerides. One last question, and then... <laughs> or two. <laughs> A lot of parents, when I talk about diet soda and crystal light and all that kind of stuff, start talking about the issue of the sweeteners. Is there any data about long-term effects with sweeteners? Because you can tell them you know, there's unknown and this is known, but they kind of look at you. 
I know it's a very hard discussion. Sometimes their jaw drops and they say, I can't believe you're recommending a diet soda to me. And I say, well, you know, it's sort of the lesser of two evils. And I don't think there's any good data to suggest right now that we should avoid Splenda. And so I feel like if they're going to have to have a soda, um, that I would rather them have a diet. Yeah. Fish oil. When you use fish oil, would you use one gram what's on the front of the bottle or what's on the back of the bottle? Because there's one gram of fish oil, there's 300 of um, acids in there. So what do you use? I like them really to look at the, the uh, EPAs and the DHAs and, you know, when they're in the pharmacy and just pick the one that has the most of each. So I like to look at the back of the bottle. Okay. So you use three tablets? Yes. Like if it's okay. Well, it depends on the age of the kid. So I right. usually start with one tablet, right? And then I can push it up if I need. Cool. If it's a younger kid versus an older kid. I, an older kid, I might start on more. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm.